loved and worthy. The week at Omega in October 2010 touched and opened my heart in so many ways. It helped bring to my conscious mind so much that I had forgotten. There is a reawakening emerging in me that brings me to tears whenever I allow myself to sit still and realize how wondrous we all truly are. On the first morning, Dr. Vice guided us into a group regression. This was not my first regression, and I was looking forward to another past life experience. I usually sense, feel, and visualize in sync with the words of the person guiding the journey. This time, however, to my surprise I saw myself as I am in this life at my current age. I was standing in a space where everything just felt hazy. I looked in front of me, and there seemed to be a curtain of fog. A bare arm came though, took my hand, and brought me curtain of fog. A bare arm came though, took my hand, and brought me through the curtain. I found myself standing in front of an old friend, Joe, who had passed in the 1970s, when we were in our 20s. Joe and I had been very close. As a matter of fact, I had never been as close to anyone before or after him. We were friends, lovers, and confidants. We would talk for hours about the possibilities of life after death. We promised each other that whoever died first would come back to the other one and explain what it was like. Eventually, we got in our own way and went our separate ways badly. About a year or two later, Joe and I spoke on the phone, and it was clear that whatever had come between us was not as strong now. He invited me to visit him the next time I was in Santa Barbara. I said that I would, but I didn't. I was afraid, and I told myself that I needed more time before I saw him face to face. Not long after that, I got a phone call from a mutual friend, who told me that Joe had taken his life. I was in disbelief. I became mad, and sad, and then mad again. If only I had called him when I was in Santa Barbara, then maybe this would not have happened. Time went on, and Joe kept his word. I would get visits from him, mostly at night in vivid dreams. There were also the times, after I had spoken to someone about how angry I was that he took his life, when I would be woken up with my bed shaking, and I could hear his voice telling me not to be mad at him. I made myself stop voicing my anger out loud, and soon I realized that I just missed him. Eventually, I told Joe I no longer wanted the dreams, and they stopped too. After that, from time to time, I felt Joe's energy around me, just knowing that he was there was so reassuring. Then one day, in the 1990s, I was in my kitchen and I could feel Joe's energy surround me. It was around me and in me. I heard him tell me that he loved me and that he was leaving this vibration and going to another dimension, where he had work to do. He told me he was going to be greeting the souls who had passed from AIDS. He showed me a quick glimpse of a space where there was so much sorrow, pain, and confusion. This was part of his debt, he said, for taking his own life. I felt his energy enveloping me and filling me with an unconditional love that I had never experienced before. Tears of joy streamed down my cheeks. I don't know how long I stood there before I again became aware that I was standing in my kitchen in the middle of the day. That was the last time I ever felt Joe's energy until the group regression on the first morning of the training. There I was, standing in front of Joe. He on the first morning of the training. There I was, standing in front of Joe. He took me to him and hugged me fully and unconditionally. He now had wings. He impressed upon me, without speaking, that he had progressed. I could feel him wrap his wings around me. It felt like there were other energies around us, also surrounding me in love. I heard the words, you are loved. You are worthy. My jaws hurt, my throat was tight, my arms ached, and tears rushed into my eyes. Joe continued to hug me until I accepted and surrendered to the message, and at that moment the physical discomfort also stopped. A teacher came and put a light crystal in my heart. I followed Dr. Weiss's voice and opened my eyes. I was back. I didn't want to be back. It was lonely and cold here. That afternoon, I volunteered to be hypnotized in front of the group so that Dr. Weiss could demonstrate a rapid induction. It worked well. While I was in hypnosis, Dr. Weiss asked me about my morning journey. I told him about meeting Joe, although I purposely did not use his name, instead referring to him simply as, a friend. I told him of the wings and of his message. I said that my friend had taken his life and that I hadn't gone to see him, as I'd promised I would. 
Dr. Vice told me that I wasn't responsible and should not have any guilt for my friend having taken his life. To my friend I was, he said, loved and worthy. Immediately, I felt a sense of relief. I hadn't consciously realized that I had carried this burden of responsibility, but now that it was spoken I could feel a layer of sadness being lifted. I could feel the emotion of the moment, yet I still sensed that I was holding back somewhat and not letting go entirely. Several days later, still during the training, a friend and I were on our way to the dining room for breakfast. A woman named Rachel was walking toward us on the path. She looked at me intently and asked, Are you Jeanette? When I said that I was, she said, I have a message for you from Joe. He says he loves you. She told me that she had gotten this message and was compelled to find me to relay it. I thanked her with tears streaming down my cheeks. This was my confirmation. Joe knew me too well. He knew he would have to bring his message through someone else just to make sure I would believe it. And I do believe it. Since this encounter, I have a sense of quiet calm. I feel more comfortable with myself than I have ever been before. I now know that we are all truly loved in ways that we cannot imagine on this physical plane. And now, finally, I accept this truth. Jeanette the Earth is like a one-room schoolhouse in which students of different grade levels are assembled together. First graders coexist with college seniors, remedial students with the gifted. Its courses are taught in every language and cover every subject. Students of all nationalities and all races attend this school, every human does. All are on the path toward a spiritual graduation. The lessons in this school are difficult because here we have bodies, so we experience illness, death, loss, pain, separation, and so many other states of suffering. Yet the earth also has such powerful redeeming virtues, like incredible beauty, physical love, unconditional love, soulmates, pleasure for all our senses, kind and compassionate people, and the opportunity for accelerated spiritual growth. Eventually, over the course of many lifetimes, we will learn all these lessons. Our education will be complete, and we will not need to reincarnate anymore. Jeanette provides a glimpse into how our education continues on the other side, even after our consciousness has left the physical body. The earth is a school, a difficult and popular one, but not the only one. In those higher realms, we do not learn through bodily sensations or emotions or relationships or illness. There, our studies are more abstract and conceptual. We discover the advanced dimensions that exist beyond our human awareness, and we begin to unlock their many mysteries. There, we see and feel the sublime manifestations of what on earth appears to be solid and material, and we acquire an understanding of these absolute energies at their most elevated vibration. There, we explore the nuances and levels of loving-kindness, compared to earth and its physical forms, it is learning at a higher octave. Even though these lessons are the graduate level courses, they are still part of our soul's curriculum. Our knowledge is always expanding. Joe tells Jeanette that he has incurred a debt for taking his own life. He probably had left a healthy body when he committed suicide. His consciousness, of course, was not hurt or damaged, but without a body it cannot do its work on the earth plane. The body is essential for the soul's manifestation in a physical dimension. Joe's soul must wait for its next incarnation to continue its spiritual journey on the earth. But it is not punished with eternal damnation or obliteration. Karma is for learning, not for punishment. And so Joe is assigned to work with the spirits of people who have died from AIDS. Here are people who have suffered greatly, dying too young because their bodies have become irreparably damaged from a horrible disease. What better way for Joe to learn the value of a healthy body, of the gift of life. While working with the souls of the victims of AIDS, Joe was not in pain or distress. He was filled with unconditional love. He was, in a sense, earning his wings, like an angelic being. He was erasing his karmic debts. If Joe, with all his debts and flaws, could make the transition from human to angel, then we all can. For truly we are all angels temporarily hiding as humans. In her story, Jeanette mentions her encounter with Rachel, who had a special message to give her. Below, Rachel tells how she received that message. Soulmate This is a part of Zindagi Ki Roshni Consultancy. It has been established for those who have lost someone and for those who are very sad in their life. About 100 PDF books and 20 short audio books of this topic will be sent to those who join it. 
This data will be sent to their email or WhatsApp. If you want to join this organization then please send WhatsApp message to this number.